So please welcome to the stage Carter Smith, Morgan Saylor, Noah Silver, Darren Liu, and producer Alex Orlovsky. So now Darren just won an award at the MTV Woo! Music Awards last night for best cinematography for Beyonce's music video, Pretty Hurts. Congratulations. Um, so I guess my first question will go to you, Carter. Um, you were at Sundance uh, with this film this year in the main competition, the narrative competition. And um, the last time you were there, you made huge waves. I think it was in 2006 with your first short film, Bug Rush, which won the jury award. Um, now, in between those two films, you went from making, you know, an indie short to making a huge DreamWorks-funded horror movie, yes, The Runes. Yes, very, very, and now different, you're very different world. Very different world. Now you're back in indie land. What brought you back to, to the indie side of things? I, I fell in love with the story that the, that the film is based on. I read the book, you know, fell in love with it. I knew I wanted to do something that was smaller in scale that I could work, you know, that I could develop with you know, from scratch. Um, and, you know, I, I read the book and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I, I you know, I, I spent about a year adapting it. Um, and I wanted to do something small that would, I, you know, I thought would be sort of easy to, to get up and get made. I'm curious. I, yeah. you know, that wasn't necessarily the case, but, yeah. you know, it was, it was, that was the intention. Um, and we're going to get to the film ahead, but what was it like going from you know, um, I don't know, making a short indie uh, film to working on a DreamWorks film, did you find the experience to be a little overwhelming or did you totally embrace it and kind of um, get with it, that type of filmmaking? You know, it w I mean, it wasn't as intimidating as I thought it would be, at, you know, at the time. I mean, I, I, I definitely, you know, on, on that, on The Ruins, I did meetings on that film for like a year trying to get the job. You know, I would go in for a meeting, go in for another meeting over and over and over. So, but I, like, I never in a million years thought that they would actually hire me for it. Um, and so, you know, by the time that they actually did, I, I had sort of written it off and didn't, uh, you know, didn't have any expectations. I mean, the, you know, the difference is you just have more money, have more days to shoot, have more resources. But, uh, you know, the actual process was uh, almost exactly the same, I, I felt like. You know, making this film, or is well, yeah. I mean, you know, sort of assembling the team, surrounding yourself with with you know creative people that that sort of understand your vision, and you know, casting and the production design and the you know the cinematography. I mean, all that all of, all of that felt very much the same, strangely. <laughs> and about surrounding yourself with the team, how did you come up with the cast for this film? I mean, everyone's just so unique in what they bring to the project. It was a long process. I mean, you know, it was one of those things where Noah had actually read a, a very early version of the script and put himself on tape. Uh, how long ago was that? Like, like three years ago or something. And he put himself on tape as both of the lead characters. And, you know, and all through the process, I sort of, he was the very first person that I ever saw um, saying the, the lines, you know, for both Adam and Jamie. Um, so it's kind of interesting that we, you know, it ended up coming all the way back around to the beginning. But, you know, I mean, you just see actors that people put themselves on tape. Um, you know, but I think that all, all of them, uh, it, you know, seeing them read, it was, it was very clear that they, you know, belonged in those parts. And, you know. And what part did you want more? Were you happy with the one you got or... <laughs> I was, I was very much so. Yeah, I mean, I think in the end it did. Um, I think both parts were interesting for you know for different reasons, but in the end, I think um, I did, did feel right to play Jamie, uh, in my opinion, for for me. Uh, and Cameron's so good at, at Adam as Adam. I couldn't see it any other different way. So Carter did the right choice. <laughs> made the right choice. <laughs> and with the two of them too, it's so important how they are together. So like you know, Noah as Jamie wouldn't have worked with so many of the atoms, you know, that, that, that were, you know, part of the process. Like, it was about finding that, that match. Now, you know, everyone here has seen a lot of ghosts on screen, various incarnations, and yours is such a unique one. I've never seen such a, a shy, timid, and lovable, yet mysterious one. Um, how did you go about, I don't know, approaching playing a ghost? I mean, for me, the, the ghost aspect of it all 
um, gave him the courage to actually come up to Adam because he'd always looked up to Adam and always wanted to have a friendship with that person. And I think when you become invisible and when you get to choose who sees you and who you want to connect with, it kind of gives you that that strength and power and control to to take the extra step and do something that you wouldn't normally do. Now, I know that you pursued the part, but I want to know how you all, um, what you all like made of the script when you first read it, because what I love about the film is that it's so hard to classify. It's not a ghost story. It's not just a coming-of-age film. It's not just a, a film about sexuality. It, it covers so many grounds. W what did you both um, make of it when you first read it? Did you get a, a firm handle on what it was about? Um, I like that it felt like a, a really honest portrayal of, of teenagers, and it wasn't like some um, commercialized version of what being a teenager is like and what going to high school is like. Um, and it was weird and cool and, and different than a lot of the things I was reading at the time and really stuck out. And, and exactly like Carter said, after you read the script, it kind of sits with you and you think about it the next day and think about it the next day. And um, it just seemed like an interesting story to tell and be a part of. And Gracie seemed really fun, too. Um, I, when, I, when I read the script, I, uh, I read it a couple, like I read many different really versions early of it. Version. It was probably um, really bad. And there was, I, I remember telling Carter, I liked the script from the beginning, but there was this one version you wrote where it kind of just had this like, sixth dimension where the you could really see and picture and feel the world that he created and you could you could really picture it in your mind and you could I could see these people moving and talking to each other and I that's yeah that's it was just such an easy read like you you didn't even think that you were reading a script it, it almost felt like you were already watching it happen so that's it's pretty special Carter nailed it yeah Awesome. So we're going to watch uh, the first clip from the film. Now, Noah, um, you're naked a lot in this movie. Well, not necessarily naked, but in your underwear, a bunch. Tidy whities. Tidy whities. Yep. Tidy -whities. <laughs> we came um, very close. Yeah. It looks cold, you know? Were Ew. you freezing? <laughs> were you guys shooting on a soundstage? Were you guys actually on location in the winter? No, I... How did you survive? Barely. Barely. No, I was outside upstate New York, February. January, February. It was freezing. Sometimes yeah. at freezing night. Freezing cold. Yeah, it was, it was cold. It was cold. <laughs> How did you get through it? How did you make sure this guy didn't die of hypothermia while uh, We while tried shooting? to treat him well. We tried to have blankets and, you know. Well, the thing is, I had full body makeup, too, so I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily put something on. Yeah, yeah it had to go that would really very cover. lightly over so it didn't mess up his makeup. It was not comfortable for him. It I mean, for, funny, for anyone, right? but he had the worst of it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, about the, the, the makeup that went into creating um, Jamie Marks, you could have gone at it from so many different methods. What made you go with that kind of... And it, it's really not... It's subtle, the, yeah. the, the approach you took well, to the makeup. I mean, the whole, the whole idea with the ghost in general always was that you know, I didn't want him to be some sort of transparent ghost that walks through doors and you know has magical powers really i wanted him you know uh, to actually be sitting you know next to adam and, or you know for him to really be physically present there so it was a it was a choice early on that he would you know there wouldn't be any special effects so it just became about uh like color palette and figuring out like what color we wanted him and mike potter is an amazing makeup designer who who worked on on the film um you know, we just tweaked it, and, and there was a lot of testing involved, you know, because, uh, you know, Cameron is a... So is a, white. <laughs> yeah, is, a, is, a, is really pale. Yeah. And so no matter what we did to Noah, Noah was always sort of showing up as tan, which yeah. we did not want. So it, it, it involved a, a little bit more than we had planned on, maybe. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any special effects in the film whatsoever, or...? A couple. A couple. But... I, not that many, right? I mean, you know, not to, not to do with special effects. I mean, there, there are times when, you know, we, like, 
we like took out a boom that dropped, you know, or so things like that, but, yeah. but not, not real like special effects. Yeah, well the reason I bring it up is because Darren's cinematography is so evocative, you always have a feeling that there's something lurking out of the frame, another ghost, another entity, another shadow. Um, what was your approach to, to creating the, 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 this world? Um, it's so distinct in the film. Well, I've I worked a number of times with Carter, so e even though I, I think Carter and I watch different kinds of movies, I mean, Carter will often bring up a film that I've never, I've never heard of, um, never, never seen. Uh, he, Carter would show me a lot of things that would describe the kind of feeling you would want in, in, in this film in particular. I mean, I've worked with Carter before, so I, I understand what kind of palette he, he likes and uh, what kind of subtlety he likes and what kind of mystery he likes. Um, so it, it, I have to tell you, it was, it, was, it was pretty easy because I think I already know what Carter is looking for. We, we, we referenced a number of films. I mean, I showed him some things that I, I, I really liked. He showed me a number of things he liked, but there wasn't much of it. It wasn't until we really just sat down at his dining room table and really started to map, up the, map out the film after having seen the location that we kind of made the film and understood where the angles were. I mean, maybe there were a couple times when we were caught off guard and something didn't really work the way th we thought it would, but I would say that we, we had a pretty good idea all the time, I think, of, yeah, of, of how we and, wanted to shoot it. And, and a lot of it was also about like, because there's a lot that happens in darkness, and so a lot of it was like, how dark is too dark? How dark is dark enough? You know, he would constantly be showing me clips like, is this too dark? Is that too dark? Do we, can we be this dark? Yeah. You know, so it was all, it was sort of like, okay, you know, figuring out like what the, what the level of darkness was going to be. Mm -hmm. and, there were, and there were times when I'd say, Carter, we really don't see anything in here. Should I put anything? Up? And Carter would say, N no, leave and it. And we ended up Let's seeing stuff. And right. we ended up <laughs> seeing stuff. <laughs> um, we have one more clip from the film to show. Now, Carter, it's clear from that scene that you have a really great approach with actors. I mean, you managed to elicit some great performance, and you know, you did. You worked with a young cast on *The Ruins*, and you worked with the young cast on this film. What is your approach? How how do you go about directing your cast? I, you know, I mean, I feel like if if you cast the film right, if you put the right actors in in the parts, then they do all the heavy lifting, you know, like that, that scene in particular, I mean, we, you know, we didn't shoot it in chunks and pieces and it's like a, like a four page scene. So, you know, it's like four and a half minutes of dialogue and, you know, we would just, we would shoot it from beginning to end without stopping. And, you know, every single time Cameron and Noah would just amaze me with something different. You know, so, I mean, I, my approach is kind of hopefully to let them do what you know, what they do best and, and, you know, gently nudge them towards where I want them to be if, if, you know, it doesn't quite align, you know? Did you both feel totally free on set to explore and do whatever you wanted? Yeah. Um, as we worked through it, we, of course, rehearsed the scenes uh, before we shot each scene and, and kind of spoke about it a little, especially the bigger ones um, and what it where it should go. Uh, but then, yeah, it felt like Carter was trusting enough to, to let it organically just um, unfold. And, and, I, and I feel like we spent a lot, probably more time before we actually started shooting, talking one-on-one -on -one about the characters, and less time actually rehearsing the scene. Yeah. You know, like it was, it was more about like having the conversation beforehand about who this girl or boy was or is, you know? Now, um, this is obviously an independent production. Was it tough to get funding for this film, given what we were talking about earlier, about you know, how it is, isn't really classifiable? It's not your average coming-of-age story. Like, how did you sell this to, to producers? Well, I mean, luckily, Alex, on the end, is a, is a producer that I had worked with before developing something, and he was the first person that I sent the script to. Yeah. So I, 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 I sort of knew that our sensibilities were you know, were aligned. Um, and I just trusted that he was going to be able to help me make this weird little movie that doesn't fit into, you know, I mean, like it would have been a lot easier to make if it was like a straight up horror movie, mm -hmm. you know, but 
uh, it never. I mean, the the book wasn't what wasn't that, and the, you know that's that was sort of forcing it to be something that it wasn't, you know. But it, it made it more difficult. I saw um, I saw Bug Crush at Sundance in 2006, just having no expectations, just wandered into a shorts program. And anyone out there who hasn't seen Bug Crush, you could go see it. You should go see it. It's really, I mean, we're one of the best shorts, you know, of the last 10 years, if not, you know, longer. But uh, I saw that and was just like, this guy's so talented, wanted to work with him, and fortunately had, you know, had that opportunity a couple years later. And then, yeah, with this one, it was hard. And I, but I think it's like, I've learned to always just sort of trust filmmakers and whenever were people were on the fence about this movie it was like educate them on Carter make sure that they saw his work I think um, you know that we were really careful in who we cast I think that's one of the hard things about getting a film like this made is it starred you know young actors and Carter wanted them to be authentically you know authentically aged so we weren't you know 26 year olds weren't an option like how old were you guys when we did this 18 they were all 18 actually yeah. luckily so you know, and so um, it was, you know, it was a long process finding people who believed in the project. Um, Omri Bezalel, another one of our producers is here. So, you know, he was, he was someone who believed in it. And, um, you know, it was, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really challenging. But I think also Carter had a clear vision. And, and, you know, when we talked about what would happen if at the end, like Jamie actually, you know, suddenly went dark and, act and you know, killed people and did this and that. And, it was, and he was very specific that that's not who the character was. And you know, we were all happy to support him in that, so. But it's one of the hardest movies I've ever put together. Now, Alex isn't the only one to share that viewpoint on, you know, Bug Rush being one of the best shorts I've ever played at Sundance. I mean, people were psyched to see this movie, like the energy in the room. I remember, I remember it was so palpable at Sundance, and when Trevor introduced you, you know, he's just so proud of you, such a fan of your work. Um, given that you've only been there once before with a short, can you talk about the kind of pressure you felt in, in following that, that initial win up with, with, with anything going forward and how you manage those kind of expectations that were no doubt placed upon you. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's nerve-wracking, you know, to, for sure. Um, I mean, I think the easiest thing is to try to have no expectations and, and you know, then everything, everyone that likes the movie is like, you know, is, is great. But I mean, one of the things that we were, uh, you know, we were working on finishing it, doing the sound mix, doing the score, you know, right up until the last minute. And so I, I feel like that, you know, it kept us so busy that we didn't have time to sort of stress out too much about, you know, what might or might not happen. Um, but as you know, like at Sundance, the audiences there are just so excited to see the, fit the films. And so, you know, just to finally have it in front of a real audience was just, you know, so incredibly liberating. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, no expectations was definitely the way, you know, the way to go for me. Awesome. Uh, we have one last clip, I lied earlier, of the film, and then we're going to open it up to uh, the audience. How did you do it? Um... Go ahead and raise your hand, we'll bring you the mic. Um, this being adapted from a book, um, as actors, as the director, cinematographer, producer, what is the process or challenges that you came, um, that you had to overcome or go through in order to bring this story to life? Well, I mean, in, in adapting it, the, you know, the, the biggest challenge was to keep, you know, what I loved about the book in the movie, you know, because I mean, a, a, a book you can, you know, you spend so much time inside the characters' heads and, you know, sort of going off on tangents, but, you know, figuring out what was the sort of the essence of what I loved about the book and then, you know, staying true to that was, was, was the most challenging. And I think that, you know, one of the things was once I, once I kind of figured out that it was Adam and Jamie and Gracie and that triangle that sort of fascinated me, once it became all about that, it, it, it sort of clicked in a way that it hadn't before. When I was trying to like shove everything that was in the book into the script, and it was just messy and you know, it wasn't working. And only once that triangle kind of became the center is when it really started to, to feel real. Christopher really, I think he was really trusting throughout the yeah. process in terms of just giving giving the book to Carter and really saying, here, you, you know, you do this. And, 
it, that always is very nerve wracking. And when he actually saw the film for the first time and really and really like loved it and was supportive, that was a real that that really made us feel good. Because although, as Carter said, we there were certain things we had to sort of carve away and simplify in order to you know to make it work as a film. The heart of the book, I think, remained intact. Yeah, and, then, and I mean, there's stuff that's in the movie that you know is not from the book. That's you know that's just in the film. And the book is actually, uh, it's called One for Sorrow, uh, by Christopher Barzak, and it's a beautiful, beautiful novel. Um, convincing the agent to let us renew the option six times not always so easy, but you know, fortunately, he stuck with us too. You know, but this is an increasingly rare situation where you have a producer who's supportive of the creative process and a director who's willing to take chances. I mean, sometimes Carter would literally let me turn the camera on the side because we thought the scene would maybe look better that way. And I mean, I'm someone who creates moving images for popular consumption, but I really feel that a, a, a place to do interesting things that are cross genre, things that really don't fit in categories to, I don't know, in, 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 not, and they're not just indulgent activities, but I really believe that we're, we try to tell a story in a new and fresh way. That, that, that arena is disappearing, you know, with television. But I, I mean, between producers like, like Omri or editors like Eric, I mean, it's one of the few opportunities that are left to really take those chances. And I, and I can tell you, those, it's those chances that um, influence a lot of the things that we'll hopefully see for a while that we're seeing now. And I'm, I'm just worried about the disappearance of, those, of that opportunity for people. Also talking about the book, I'm kind of curious how you came across it, how you found it, if you could talk briefly about the early stages of multiple options, and, and also if you think you'll do more adaptations, or if you yeah, I mean, I, I just read it. I just picked it up in a bookstore and read it. And, you know, I wasn't looking for something to adapt or a film. I was just, re it, you know, reading it as a, you know, as a reader and, and fell in love with it. And, you know, um, eventually, like, sort of six months later, when I couldn't stop thinking about it, I was like, let's just check and see if that's available. And then it was available. And, you, you know, you sort of option it for X number of, you know, months. And then you have to re-option. And then, re you know, sort of until you make the film, you sort how, of have to keep... How long ago did you read it for the first time? Uh, I mean, at this point, probably five years ago, I guess. And then I waited about six months and then, and then took about a year to, to, to write, to do the adaptation. You know, but it's like this ticking clock because you have this number of months and you have to get the film put together and financed and made before that the option expires. You know, so it's, it's a little stressful. I mean, it sounds like when, you know, when you first option it and you think, oh, I've got 18 months, you know, and then it goes like away so quickly. Hi. Um, I was wondering why I picked the name Jamie Marks is Dead for the title, like what other names were in contention and what went around with the process of picking that exactly. I mean, it's a good name. It like sticks out and catches your attention, but... Well, I mean, the book the book was called One for Sorrow, and it, that's from a from a nursery rhyme that you know played a big part in the book. But uh, you know, after after we sort of got further in, I realized that that nursery rhyme was not going to play a part in the film, and I kept trying to force that nursery rhyme in there, and it just wasn't working. It wasn't working. And so once I str I tried to sort of think of other other names. I mean, one of the you know in the in the first part of the book as well as the film. I mean, Jamie Marks is this kid that no one really knew him when he was alive, and and as an audience, we don't really ever get to see him when he when he's alive either. And it's one of those Just one scene, one scene. Yeah, but you know, it, it's sort of like uh, I liked the idea that everybody was talking about Jamie Marks and that the fact that he was dead, but no one really. You know, that didn't really mean anything to anyone other than, other than you know, that it was something to talk about. And that, that the phrase, Jamie Marks is dead, was probably, you know, his name was said more in the weeks after, after he died than it had been in his entire, you know, school life. And luckily, Christopher Barzak approved the title change. Did you write the script and then go looking for financing or do both at the same time? Yeah, I waited until I, I wrote the script and then gave it to Alex, and then we, uh, you know, worked on it together and sort of, you know, shaped it a little bit. Um, 
and you know, but, and got it into a good place before we, we, you know, you only get that chance to make the first impression with financers and people once, and so you want to make sure it's it's in as good a shape as possible before anyone reads it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, as it's you, it's very very rare that you send something out once and immediately people say yes. You're always going to get you know, 50 no's, but all you need is one yes, and sometimes that takes three months, sometimes it takes two years. It's just about also understanding when you are just hearing no's, you know, being able to ask why are people saying no and figuring out how to address that, and that was where we did, you know, we did sort of clarify and simplify the story, and I think in the process of having people respond to it, you know, you always have to evolve and make something better or sort of more, you know, it's just like find the way to get to yes. And with that, uh, this talk unfortunately comes to an end. Uh, the film's available to download on iTunes on August 29th, and it's also opening in theaters this Friday. So thank you, everyone, for, for thank you. coming today. Thank you.